This is our first look at the muscular system. So there are a couple of different kinds of muscles in the human body. There are three, in fact. Smooth muscle, which can be found in places like blood vessels and the digestive system. Skeletal muscle, which is what we're going to focus on in this unit. And cardiac muscle, which is only found in the heart. Oh, that's supposed to be a heart. There we go. Um, so the functions of skeletal muscle are first and mostly to help to perform any kind of movement that the body will need. Um, there are kind of two ways that muscles perform actions. The first is involuntary, which means that you don't decide to do it. These are things like blinking, breathing, digesting your food, um, things of that nature. And then there are the voluntary actions, which are the ones we're going to talk mostly about. Those are actions that you consciously decide to do. So walking, jumping, texting, writing, um, talking, all of those things. The second major function of skeletal muscle is to produce heat for the body, which helps to maintain homeostasis. Remember, we've got a few kind of major functions that have to happen all the time. And so in order to keep the body at about 37 degrees Celsius, um, the muscles create quite a lot of that heat for our body. Um, so we are going to be looking at, again, primarily skeletal muscle and primarily voluntary movements. So here is the general structure of skeletal muscle. All muscle in the skeletal system is put together in bundles. So what we have are these very, very long thread-like fibers that are bundled together to create different groups of muscle, and those different groups of muscle do different jobs. So if we take a look at this picture, skeletal muscle tissue bundles are surrounded by a connective tissue layer. We're looking right here. That connective tissue layer is called the fascia. So fascia. Um, and what the fascia does is it provides a little bit of um, slipperiness so that bundles of muscle can slide past one another without sticking, and it also separates each bundle, which allows them to contract um, more individually when necessary. At the end of each muscle, there is usually a point where the fascia connects to tendon and the tendon connects to bone. So let's say this is the humerus or the upper arm bone, and we have a bicep, for example. At the end of that bicep muscle is a tendon, which I'm going to show here in green, that connects directly to the bone. Tendons connect muscles to bones. And then between those tendons, we have a layer of fascia around each muscle bundle. So that would kind of be blown up and seen right there. Um, there are some places where muscles don't t attach directly to bone. They either attach to other muscles or they attach in some way other than tendons. And there are some examples of that in this picture. You can see some examples in the head, some examples in the low back, and some examples along the abdominal wall. At those points, the connection is called an aponeuroses. So there isn't any tendon action there. As we zoom in on this skeletal muscle tissue, we can see the fascia, and then inside the fascia is another layer of connective tissue called the epimysium, which we'll look at more in the next Here you can see a picture of where we have the bone, the tendon, and then the fascia would be connecting at about this point to the tendon, and beneath the fascia here we have the epimysium. So that surrounds, epi means around, that surrounds the entire bundle of muscle fibers, and then inside of that we have a smaller layer that surrounds each individual bundle called the paramysium. So epimysium surrounds all bundles, perimysium surrounds an individual bundle, and each of those individual bundles is called a fascicle. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, and probably behind number six there's an eighth, but we can't see it. We have seven different fascicles in this one muscle bundle. Inside of each fascicle, we have smaller fibers, right? You can see we've pulled out one of those smaller fibers. Around each of those smaller fibers is another connective tissue layer called the endomycium. So this is in, this is around, so the names kind of tell you where you can find them. And each of those connective tissue layers allow the muscle bundles to work somewhat independently. So now we have zoomed in even further. Here is our picture of the fascicle that we pulled out in that last shot. And within that fascicle, we have pulled out a single muscle bundle. So what's interesting about this is each single muscle bundle, so let's look at this as one single muscle bundle, and it is actually a single cell. Each one of these little fibers that you see right here, that's called a myofibril, each of those is one single cell. So within this fascicle, right, this is the fascicle, we have a bunch of little individual cells. Each cell, instead of just being a, you know, a round little um, sphere like we think of when we think of a biological cell, muscle cells are very, very, very long and more like a thread or a fiber. And each cell, just like with all the other cells you've learned about in biology, every cell has a membrane to protect what comes in and out. The membrane in muscle cells is called the sarcolemma. The term sarc is Greek for muscle. So whenever you see sarc in front of a word, it means it has something to do with a muscle. So sarcolemma is a muscle cell membrane, and the fluid that fills up the muscle cell is called sarcoplasm. That just helps to provide the shape and the um, structure of the cell. There are also lots of nuclei, because nuclei are what tell the cell when to contract and relax and also contain the DNA and all of that. And then there are also these structures called myofibrils. Myo is another term for muscle. And I think I said before that sarc was Greek, but it's, I believe it's actually, no, sarc is Greek, myo is Latin for muscle. So a myofibril is a muscle fiber. That is the smallest little repeating unit of muscle contraction. So, we have our myofibril, and now we've zoomed in even further. So we're on our, what, our fifth zoom in at this point? Inside the myofibril, we have two very important proteins. There is an actin protein, which is really thin. In this picture, the actin are blue. So actually, let me try to stick with our color theme here. Hello, blue. So right here is actin. And we have thick myosin filaments which in our picture down below is red, so that would be the myosin. Let's do this, myosin and actin. And they are stacked, so you'll have an actin, then a myosin, then an actin, then a myosin, etc. And when you look at that under a microscope, what it looks like is a striping band, sort of like um, tiger stripes or zebra stripes, but it's very, very clear. And in science, we call that striping, striations. Each little, um, so often in the myofibril, the proteins will be attached to this fixed point. What that means is that that point is immobile. It never, ever moves. So if the muscle wants to contract, what it has to do is pull the fibers together. When a muscle contracts, the it actually gets shorter, it gets tighter together. So in order to contract, these two fixed points, let's call them one and two, they have to pull together and close this distance right here. So when that happens, the muscle fiber gets closer, these actin proteins get pulled together so that they are basically touching, and that is muscle contraction. The, from point one to point two is called a single sarcomere, and one sarcomere gets shorter, 
in order to contract. When a whole big group of muscle needs to contract, like your bicep, for example, there will be sarcomeres on either side that are all at the same time pulling the actin together to shorten the individual sarcomere. When all the sarcomeres contract together, the entire muscle contracts. One of the interesting things about muscle contraction is that the muscles can't decide when to contract. They have no ability to make that decision on their own. They have to be told to contract, and they are told by either the brain or the spinal cord, but since most muscles are nowhere near the brain or the spinal cord, like your bicep, for example, there has to be some kind of messenger that gets that message from the brain all the way to the bicep. That messenger is called a motor neuron. So this is just a nerve that carries an impulse from the brain or spinal cord and tells the muscle, now it's time to contract. The neurons never touch other neurons or muscles. They are completely independent. So the information may be coming down here from the brain. The brain's saying, contract, 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 contract. And the message is coming, but when it gets to the end of this nerve... So this is the nerve, this is the muscle, let's say a bicep. When the message gets to this point, it has to stop, right? There's, that's the end of the road. And so now what happens is we need to use a chemical to jump across this little space. This little space is called the synapse. It's just the term for the gap between a nerve and a muscle. So. Let's write that here, synapse. So we need a chemical to leave the nerve cell, go across the gap, and then bind to the muscle cell. That messenger, that chemical, is called a neurotransmitter. So neuro means nerve, transmitter basically means a message. So a neurotransmitter carries a message from the nerve to the muscle. And when that chemical touches the muscle, it stimulates the muscle to contract and then the muscle contracts. When the neurotransmitter goes back to the nerve, then the muscle relaxes. Together, one neuron, sometimes there are many, but let's say one neuron and one little piece of muscle together are called a motor unit because that both parts are necessary for the action to take place. Okay, so that's it for our first look at muscles. Um, there was a lot going on here. I am sure you're going to have questions. Here's what you should use to guide your summary. Um, try to answer as much as you can from memory. All of the information should be in your notes. Make sure that you come to class with two or three discussion questions and I'll see you soon.